Okay, we make no apologies. When you look at the biblical position, it doesn't start with fossils. It says God created everything and there was no death. So ipso facto, the first geologists, as well as John McGuire and Joseph, etc., believed the world was created and it was created perfect. And God, when he made life, made each thing after its own kind. Implication, jellyfish would always turn into jellyfish. They'd never happen by accident. Real simple. In fact, so simple, people say, that's just naive. But the Bible's emphatic. God created the world very good. And whether you were a dinosaur or a human being or a jellyfish, there was no necessary death in God's perfect creation. Okay, all which brings us to Kangaroo Island. It's just off the south coast of South Australia. Um, as I said, we got permission from the South Australian Government Museum System, which technically claims ownership of this area uh, as a fossil site, and they allowed Joe to take back a beautiful specimen. If I didn't do that, of course, I'd get him thrown in jail at the airport, and we got to avoid things like that. There's one of my favourite sites at Kangaroo Island. See the nice big jetty? I love going fishing on Kangaroo Island. I love looking at the kangaroos, and they're only tiny ones, none of these big guys down there, and I love actually collecting the live specimens, the fishes that are there. I mean, look, eat your heart out. Plenty of good food still on Kangaroo Island, uh, provided you don't eat the kangaroos and get <laughs> tackled by the greenies and things like that. But here's what it's famous for, these lovely trilobites at the base of the Cambria, beautifully preserved in a orangey brown iron phosphate type compound pretty unique on the planet and along with that can you guess what that is you're right it's a worm now if you want to fossilize a worm please don't try to pretend you can take a long time worms are soft and squishy no hard parts and on this part of the island you'll find hundreds of worms many of them rolled up not digging they're flat they're horizontal they've been washed in along with the other creatures and buried before they went rotten. There's a present day worm. There's a marine worm on the right hand side. The worms haven't changed. Uh, I mean, I keep telling people it was this that stopped me believing in evolution. I used to be an ardent evolutionist, but I couldn't find any evidence of it in the rocks. Worms from the oldest ones in Australian rocks up to the present have turned into worms. And yes, I've been able to gain heaps and heaps and heaps of these worms, some for our collection. Fabulous stuff. Oh, and look at this one here. Um, these shales along the Emu Bay area, uh, originally you could find them on the beach. They would fall down. You still do that after a, a, a big sort of a quake or a storm. Other than that, the university's got a big dig site there, which is off limits. Um, you see what's in some of these rocks? Can you see this worm? It's a soft-bodied polychaete worm. Um, take you closer. Now, have you ever found a soft-bodied polychaete worm? Uh, simple? No, no, no. Trilobites aren't simple either. And polychaete worms, well, they're still here. Marine bristle worms, they've got a marvellous nervous system. They may be soft, they don't have bones, but they've got antennae and they are still here. You'll find they haven't evolved one bit from technically the base of the Cambrian, the pre-Cambrian rocks, right up to the present. Now, if you're waiting for things to evolve, give up now. F face the fact your theory is a failure. The evidence, even if you thought these rocks were hundreds of millions of years old, actually favours biblical creation. And you don't need to worry about the millions of years because the worms have produced their own kind, both the earthworms and the marine worms. I mean, up at Jurassic Ark, our outdoor creation museum, we find worms that are half a metre long, that are living in the soil. And boy, do they chew up your garden pretty fast. And these ones do the same with the mud that they're in. Okay, there's no doubt about it. If you're looking for the evidence of creation, the fossils are one of the best support systems. Because you see, evolution doesn't work one bit. The worms just appear. They appear in the Cambrian, the pre-Cambrian. I mean, the stromatolites are beautiful. Out there, yep, you're wondering where I found that. There's an old quarry way west of Alice Springs, and that was in some of the rocks that the trucks had dug up. Fantastic. And stromatolites are still here. They produce their own kind. 
Now, I've said that before and I'll say it again until we finish broadcasting or the Lord takes me first. There are plenty of opinions and theories that disagree with biblical history. You know, I saw some good questions that we might bring up, up a bit later about people saying, add miracles and it ceases to be science. I'll tell you what, if you don't add miracles, your science is already non-science, nonsense, because your theory of evolution is absurd as you can get. The facts never contradict what's in the biblical content at all. So when you find your trilobites flooded in and buried with beautifully preserved worms and and the, the little polychaete worms and preserved with that lovely iron phosphate material, no doubt about it, they began as good as they would ever get. Many creatures have died out like the trilobites seem, but none have evolved. Oh, Kangaroo Island, South Australia, perhaps one last lesson before we actually throw it up into our first bit of questions. And we'll take maybe a couple of questions, Joe. Then I'll move on to the uh, place where the Cambrian explosion is most famous over there in uh, Canada, in Alberta, as my friend and I, Vance, interact on the screen here. There's our jetty again. There's the beautiful ocean. It's separated from South Australia, and it used to have living on there pygmy py emus. Yep. They were eaten out pretty fast when Europeans arrived. It has very tiny kangaroos. Perhaps the big ones got eaten off as well. And it has things like unconformities. You see the rock at the bottom layer? That's sort of slanting nearly 90 degrees. And then there's a horizontal shelly layer at the top. Now, where those two layers meet is called an unconformity. The, the layers don't conform with one another. Something has been eroded away. Now, don't take my word for it. You can get the Kangaroo Island District Plan, courtesy of some of my friends down there in the government. And what you discover is the front of it, it's got a beautiful geologic column, except for one reason. It tells you Derek Age was right. Do you see the dark bits? That's the bits that we've actually been able to map. You see the white bits? That's the bits that aren't there. Do you see most of it aren't there? Uh, that's the point Derek Age make. Most of the geologic column, whether you're talking about the Grand Canyon or anywhere else, isn't there. In fact, Joe, if I can wake you up from your reverie there, when you walked around the east coast of England with one of your geological experts looking at the geologic column, what did he say about the presence of it in England? Are you awake? Perhaps he's gone to sleep. I'll wake him up a little bit later with the same question. That was all right. My mic was muted. That was all. Sorry. <laughs> I was answer, answer the question then. When you walked up the east coast of, of England with one of your geological guides, yeah. uh, an, an expert, what did he say about the geologic column on the east coast of England? Well, the interesting of um, England, particularly around Norfolk, which is where I'm originally from, you have several instances where you have things like massive great big chalk cliffs that have been thrusted up on top of the um, Ice Age and the glacial uh, Pleistocene deposit. So you've got stuff that's back to front, right? And I was talking to him about, well, how do we know that these are in succession? How do we know that layers and so on and so forth? Because one of the problems is these uh, chalk cliffs, which are supposedly around the 65 million years old, um, are basically touching these Pleistocene rocks, which are supposed to be uh, a few hundred thousand years old. And so you're missing quite a significant amount of time there by the secular standards. And he was saying to me, well, we know that they go in this order because the geological column is a bit like a, a book load of pages torn out going all over the place and you have to go wandering around the world trying to find the different pages and piecing them back together again uh he said of course the only problem is they don't have page numbers <laughs> so he said <laughs> we have to use the words and the way that they um fit together which are reality in reality the fossils to try and piece together a picture of where these rocks go in succession and i said well how do you know that these fossils are in succession he said oh we know the fossils are in succession because we can match them up using evolution how we know evolution fits right so really you're starting with a pre-assumption that number one evolution happened number two evolution happened in a way that preserved enough fossils to be able to work out a succession of life 
even though that's not what the fossil record actually says. And number three, you then have to wander around the planet hoping that you find the correct pages and, of course, ignoring any of the pages that don't really fit and piece them together um, really based fully upon a faulty assumption in the first place. So I was quite impressed with how honest he was <laughs> in his <laughs> arguments, but when you're in places where you're missing sort of 40 to 50 million years um, or, you know, or you're, 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 you're missing, uh, you've got rocks that are thrust on top of other rocks which aren't supposed to be there, you do need to come up with some of these excuses. True. Now let me show you how this shows up. There's the unconformity at the bottom. There's a shelly bed above it. How much is missing? How would you know if you go by the fossils? They look fairly recent, um, the sort of ones that are on the beaches today. And remember, this is how Lyell decided to classify the system, not by real dates, not by radiocarbon, but by the percentage of fossils that were still here. There's the sea that's there. In fact, it's a beautiful area to visit, but underneath the shelly beds are all the metamorphic rocks eroded off with the shells sitting on the top in between the gullies. Now, I think I'll move a bit further and, and not come back to this later. It's a great point. Here we are at a famous site, uh, beautiful in springtime with lots of flowers, but it does make because they've turned it into an environmental park. So no, I won't take you there to collect specimens. I will take you there to watch, but here's what they're telling you. The official line is there are three major layers here, and then they tell you some interesting things about it. It's Hallett Cove. It's beautiful. Not too much stuff growing on it, but you can see the distinct layers. In fact, they've got diagrams left over from when they first put the signs up, and you can see there's a one to two million years at the top. Then there's 280 million year old rock. Then there's drop stones right down the bottom. Translated, I mean, that's beautiful stuff. And yes, I've clambered all over here and there are loose specimens. You can look in them for fossils and all sorts of things, but it pays to read the signs because there you are. You have a four million year old top layer and way down the bottom, you have a layer that's actually, well, how old does that say that is? Look at that, 600 million years old. And then all that's joining it together is a layer of glacial sediments, 280 million years old. Quick, do some maths. The time chart shows a gap of about 320 million years, which has not been accounted for. There are no rocks at Hallett Cove from this time span. I remember taking a young geologist there, and he was as mad as a hatter at me after we'd finished. Because what's 320 million years between friends? The trouble is, this is not just at Hallett Cove. You can follow this unconformity for ages, and it's, it's, it's a massive unconformity. There's the beautiful site. Uh, of course, the tide does come right in, so I only go around here at low tide and uh, try to avoid winter when the, when the rain and everything is coming down there. But there it is in diagram form. So you can actually see the point we're making, as well as the one Derek Ager is making, as well as the one Joseph Skye to the East Coast Geology of England is making. Do you see the Pleistocene? That's the one that's supposed to be associated with an ice age, uh, there's three to four million years missing between the sediments at top uh, and that next layer down, the Pliocene. Three to four million years. What's that between friends? Well, it's an awful lot of record. Uh, then you actually go down to the next one where the Pliocene sits on the Permian. Permian, named after Perm in Russia, named by an Englishman, Charles Lyell, because the king said to Charles, go and help my cousin out, will you? Yep, all the Russians and the English were related. So he ended up labelling the rock at the bottom Permian and now because of Lyell and Darwin and the modern dating techniques based on Lyell, we have three to four million years missing at the top and then 265 million years missing under the Pliocene. Then by the time you get down to the Precambrian, the one that they didn't check first in England, between the bottom of the Permian and remember Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Permian, all of that's missing, plus a little bit of the Precambrian, 330 million years, which means you add it all up, 3 to 4 plus 265, that's 269, plus 330, that's 569. That's over 600 million years are actually missing in the space of less than half a kilometre. Now, can you realise why Joseph Skide says it's mostly missing? 
Can you realise why the column in the South Australian field book shows mostly white space? We're going to finish off a bit later on after you have a chance to ask me questions. We're going to go to the Albot, uh, Alberta Walcott quarry and have a look at the place where a lot of this Cambrian uh, explosion actually is alleged to happen.